Now, this morning, we want you to take your Bibles, please, and turn with us to Psalm 103. And while you're turning, I, I do want to just compliment all these young people that are up here on the front rows. You know, last week, I, uh, I wondered where the girls were. And, and now you see them all here. You know, where they were last week, they were all serving. They were working the cameras. They were doing all kinds of things. So can we thank the young ladies for their service? My, my, my. Isn't that wonderful? And, you know, you guys serve as well. So I don't want to leave you guys out of the, out of the equation as well. But I just love it that you guys are up here. I don't know what prompted you to do so. But, man, I am thrilled that you're up in the front rows. That, that helps an old guy like me. It keeps me young. See, have the young guys and gals sitting up here in front. So... Anyway, we're thrilled that all of you are here, regardless of where you're sitting. But uh, it's great to be in the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here this morning? Ah, oh, praise Jesus. God's good. Okay, Psalm 103. Uh, will you please stand? And we're going to read this entire psalm. It's a psalm of praise. It is a psalm that extols the mercy of God. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and all that is... In my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. Whenever you see that word compassionate, uh, it's that Hebrew word hesed, which speaks of the tender mercies of God. The Lord is compassionate, he's merciful. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities for as high as the heavens are above the earth so great is his love for those who fear him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us as a father has compassion on his children so the Lord has compassion tender mercy on those who fear him for he knows we are formed how we were formed, and he remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it, and it's gone. Its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love, his mercy is with those who fear him, his righteousness with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. The Lord has established his throne in heaven, and his kingdom rules over all. Praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word. Praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts, you servant of his who do his will. Praise the Lord, all his works, everywhere in his dominion. Now let's repeat this last phrase together. Praise the Lord. O oh, my soul. Let's do that one more time. Praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. Father in heaven, how we love you and praise you for this opportunity to come now to study your word. I pray that you would open our minds and our hearts to your truth, that you would help us to emulate our Father in heaven, the one who is merciful. May we learn to be merciful to each other and to emulate you even when it's hard. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, and your grace. Teach each one of us to do your will in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> he gets what he deserves. He had it coming to him. I tried to warn him, but he did it anyway. You know, he just doesn't listen. 
He has a mind of his own. He's going to do it his way no matter what. These are the words that oftentimes come from our mouths that unfortunately are hurtful and they do not contribute to the building up of the body of Christ. I'm sure all of us at one time or another have heard these words repeated. Maybe we've overheard those words said to someone else. Maybe we haven't said those words, but we've thought about saying those words. And sometimes the Holy Spirit catches us and we don't do that, which is wonderful. But why is it that we as the people of God struggle more with mercy than anything else? We are very quick to lash out. We are quick to settle scores, but mercy seems to be foreign from our actions and our vocabulary. We are quick to criticize. We are very slow in showing compassion. Now, unfortunately, God's disposition is quite unlike our disposition. God is merciful. Think about that. Instead of giving to us what we deserve, just stop and think. If we all receive what we deserved, we'd all be in deep weeds this morning. Were it not that God has been merciful toward us, where would any of us be today? We have been the recipients of mercy and as such need to be merciful in our relationships with each other. God calls us to be people of mercy. He doesn't want us to live our lives based on the flesh, which so easily gets involved when there is an issue between brothers. But God is constantly showing his mercy to us. And even when we mess up, he is merciful. He puts up with us. Do you ever stop and think how much God has to put up with? Just take a look at what happened this past week. God continues in mercy to put up with us and to be gentle and kind toward us. And we, in return, oftentimes become very unkind and accusatory of one another. And it hurts the cause of Jesus. And it stunts the body of Christ from becoming all that we have the potential of becoming. Psalm 81, 89, verse 1 puts it this way. I will sing of the Lord's great love, his great mercy forever. With my mouth, put a circle around those words. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. You see, what God is calling us to do is to use our mouths in a positive way. Now, unfortunately, that's not the way many of us operate. Uh, we use our mouths to sometimes not speak the best about others or to question others. We use our mouths many times to hurt rather than to bless. And yet, once we are full of the understanding that God is a merciful God and by faith we have received his nature. Now, just stop and think about this. When you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, he pulled out the old nature, and he's given to you a brand new nature. And that new nature is to be one that is characterized by mercy and grace and love and compassion and forgiveness. That's the new nature. But all too often, that new nature gets squashed by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we allow some of the old nature to keep creeping into our lives and especially into our relationships with each other. And we forget that God, our Father, 
<laughs> who loves us so much, is full of mercy and grace, and he wants to pull us to himself and transform us so that we can be people of grace and mercy. William Cowper, who wrote that great hymn, There is a fountain filled with blood made this statement. He said, man may dismiss compassion from his heart, but God never will. God is a God of mercy. And that's something that we need to be reminded of every single day because of who God is. And we have passed from death into life because he has saved us. Even when we had no capacity to reach out to him, he took the steps because of his mercy. He withholds what we deserve and he gives to us something we don't deserve and that is his grace. Mercy and grace. These are the qualities that I believe God wants to rebirth in all of our hearts. Now, As you take a look at the Word of God, we discover four great truths about God's mercy. First of all, number one, God's mercy cannot be earned. In Titus 3, verses 4 and 6, the Bible says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, notice, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy He saved us. You see, we are not saved on the basis of what we do. We are saved on the basis of what God has done for us. You see, mercy is God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. And so, it's not something that we earn. We can't do enough good deeds to merit eternal life. Eternal life is a gift that comes via the mercy and grace of the Lord Jesus. Number two, God's mercy is his sovereign will in action. In Romans chapter 9, verses 14 and 18, uh, the apostle reminds the Romans about the way God dealt with Pharaoh when he refused to let the Israelites go free. And he makes this statement in verse 18, Therefore God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. See, God is a sovereign God. He is merciful, but when we refuse to obey him, that becomes a stronghold that Satan builds in our hearts, and it hardens our hearts. That's what happened to Pharaoh. And he's reminding the Romans here that God is a sovereign God, and he is in control of all of the actions of mankind. Number three, God's mercy is new every day talked about this a couple of weeks ago Lamentations 3 22 and 23 because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed for his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness do you realize when you got up today just by that very act you were receiving the mercy of God When that alarm clock went off, oh, it's so nice to snuggle back into bed. That's the mercy of God. Every time we get up, he is overseeing us. Just stop and think of how mercy has protected you this past week. How God in his sovereignty has looked after you. He's been aware of every detail that's gone on in your life. And in his mercy and love, he constantly is caring for every single one of us. And then number four, mercy, God's mercy is eternal. You see this in the text that we want to look at here in just a few minutes, verses 17 and 18. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love was with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The mercy of God is from everlasting to everlasting, from eternity past 
to eternity future and everything in between. God's mercy is evident in creation. His mercy is evident in our conscience. And his mercy is evident in many of the circumstances of life. Now, as we dig into this psalm this morning, we discover that this psalm is preeminently a psalm of praise. You'll note he begins the psalm and he ends the psalm with praise. Verse 1, praise the Lord, O my soul, and all my inmost being, praise his holy name. And he concludes, verse 22, praise the Lord, all his works everywhere in his dominion. Praise the Lord, O my soul. So from beginning to end, this is a psalm of great praise. And what the psalmist is praising God preeminently for is for his compassion or for his mercy or for his abounding love. And the more we contemplate, once we get a grasp on how God daily is merciful to us, it will enable us I believe, to be much more merciful in our relationships with each other. Now, it's interesting here. In verse 2, he says, Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now, whenever you see something like that, you ought to put a circle around the word benefits because what is coming is very specific and something that we don't want to dismiss lightly. And so that leads us to our first point. The psalmist gives us a personal recollection of God's mercy. He's in a reflective mode, and as he contemplates this compassion, this mercy of God that is from everlasting to everlasting, he first of all is so thankful that God forgives his sins. God forgives our sins. That word forgive means to let go, to depart. And it portrays this act of God in pardoning us and removing guilt from us. Notice in verses 10 and 12, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. All God's people said, Amen. Oh my. That's an incredible statement. He does not treat us as our sins deserve, or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love toward those who fear him, that is, who reverence him, who acknowledge him, who adore him and bless him as far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgressions from us this is the promise of God this is evidences of his mercy in his mercy he forgives our sins he doesn't treat us according to our sins man we'd all be in, in a mess if that was the case but he forgives us 1 John 1, 9 in the New Testament reemphasizes this. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Our part is to confess. God's part is to forgive. One of the things that we're learning as you look at those Asbury revivals, the revival has come as God's people have confessed and repented. The more we make excuses for our wrongdoing, the more we... We justify what we do. Revival can't come. But when there's genuine repentance and confession, then God does what we can't do. And he moves. And he does things that are out of the ordinary. The Bible says he does more than we can even ask or expect. You see, God is in the business of moving in hearts and transforming us on a regular basis. Number two, not only does God forgive our sins, he heals our diseases. Notice, that word heal can also be translated to repair or darn or mend. Now, how many of you know what darning is? Eh, a few of you. Now, when I was a little kid growing up, 
my mom would darn my socks. You know, I'd have big holes in my socks, and I can still remember mom in the living room working with that needle, uh, covering up this big hole, darning it, stitching it back together. Now, today, when we get holes in our socks, we just trade them in for new ones. But back in the day, you know, we had to darn. And that's exactly what the word heal does. He darns us. He stitches us back together. That word heal also means to stitch together, to, to repair that which is broken. He heals our diseases. Aren't you thankful that he's the great physician? You see... You know, I mean, praise God for doctors and nurses and medicine. I mean, they, they can do all kinds of things. I mean, they can cut and they can take away and they can set that which is broken. But only God can heal. I mean, he's the only one that knits us back together. He darns us back together. He sets us up right. Aren't you thankful for this? I mean, especially coming out of COVID, look how sometimes and we grieve over those that were lost. But think of all those that did survive. Because God is the one who heals our diseases. Sometimes God chooses not to heal. Does that mean he doesn't care for us? No, I don't believe that's the case. Rather, when God chooses not to heal, he has better things in store for us. Because our ultimate healing is to be with him. And that will be something that all of us look forward to. So he forgives our sin. David's so thankful. He heals our diseases. Number three, God redeems our lives from the pit. That means he he rescues us. Our life was on a wrong track. We were going our own way. We were doing our own thing. But God redeems us. He buys us back by payment of a price. And what was that price? It was the death of his son Jesus. You see, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs Jesus his very life. For you to be set free this morning, Jesus died in our place. He took the punishment we deserve. He's the one that we owe our everything to. Number four, I love this. He crowns us with love and compassion or mercy. That means he surrounds us daily. Do you realize when you get up tomorrow morning and go to work, you're surrounded by the mercy of God? His mercy is right beside you. His mercy is all around you. It encompasses each one of us. Do you realize as transformed individuals, as men and women made new by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are the apple of his eye? He takes care of us. He goes before us. When you are facing issues this coming week that you don't know how to handle, God's mercy is right there. His compassion is right there. And he promises to take care of us no matter what the situation may be. We are encompassed with his love and his mercy. And then number five, he satisfies us with good. Notice in verse 5, he says, The Lord is the one who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. There's an ancient fable which says that an eagle flies periodically so near to the sun that it drops scorched into the sea and then reemerges rejuvenated with new strength. See, that's what God does for us. He renews us. When we don't know where to go, that mercy, that grace renews us and rejuvenates us with new strength. You see, it is God's mercy that empowers all of us to live a vigorous and powerful life in Christ. And then number two, he not only does some personal recollection, but he also does some past reflection on God's mercy. He begins to look back over Israel's history. And you see this in verses 6 through 10. In verses 6 and 7, he reflects on Israel's history. He remembers how God miraculously delivered them from Pharaoh. 
how he led them across the sea, how he opened up the waters for them, how he had to punish them because they refused to believe, how they spent time in the wilderness. And, and as the psalmist reflects upon all the ups and downs of Israel, he is reminded that God is merciful even when Israel was doing their own thing. And God was so compassionate. I, I read some of these Old Testament passages and God's people are be, being blessed to God. They're in obedience to him. And then for whatever reason, they start flirting with the enemy. And they begin to take on the enemy's characteristics. And before you know it, they're deep in sin. And God has to judge them. You take a look at that history and it's just up and down. Up, it's unbelievable. And yet through it all, as the psalmist reflects, through all of the ups and downs of Israel, God has been merciful toward them when they wandered far from the path, when they deserved nothing but his wrath. He puts up with them. Now eventually they experience his judgment, but as you take a look at some of these Old Testament passages, how patient he is. And his patience is because of his mercy. In verse 8, he revels. <laughs> he is just so excited about the compassion of God. He says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Slow to anger and abounding in love. You know, things upset us, and what do we do? We react in anger many times. And when we react in anger, you usually say things that we shouldn't say. But that's not the way God is. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of infinite love and compassion. And the psalmist, as he reflects on God's dealings with the people of God, how merciful he's been, and then he just stops and says, oh, God, you are so great. You are so full of compassion. I'm overwhelmed with you. But in the next verse, notice, he realizes that there are some limitations to God's mercy. Look at verse 9. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. In other words, God will not reprimand continually without taking some corrective action. See, there comes a time when mankind, whether it's a nation or an individual, and we keep on perpetually sinning, even though we know what is right. In fact, I think greater judgment is coming upon those who know the right and do the wrong than those that have no ability to know the right and wrong. The only way we know right and wrong, in my mind, is through a personal relationship to Christ. Because that's when our lives are changed and transformed. But you see, God sometimes has to awaken us by punishing us. Not because he doesn't love us, but because he wants us to get back on track. What does the Bible say? The Lord loves those he what? He chastens. And some, sometimes when we feel like we are being corrected and chastened by the Lord, we, 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 we react, oh my, we don't like that. And yet that is a supreme evidence of how much God loves and cares for us. And he does it in a way that we do not deserve. But notice, according to our great mercy, because following verse 9 is verse 10. Notice, he does not treat us according to our sins or repay us according to our iniquities. Even in correcting us, God is merciful to us. And then here in Psalm 103 and verse 14, he recognizes that God never forgets our human frailty. I love this verse. For he knows how we were formed. He formed us, didn't he? He remembers that we are dust. You see, because God knows how frail we are, because he knows how prone we are to do our own thing. He doesn't get angry and peeved at us when we fail and miss the mark. Oh, it hurts him deeply. 
It grieves the heart of God. Let me tell you, when we take matters in our own hands and think we know better than God, it hurts the heart of God. Because he loves us so much. When we love our mates and we love them so much, if anything negative happens to them or hurt comes to them, it hurts us. And that's exactly how God feels about each one of us. It hurts him deeply when we do our own thing. But he doesn't keep a scorecard. Aren't you glad? God does not keep a scorecard. He doesn't bring up all the times that we have sinned and messed up. In fact, the Bible says he's not against us. He is for us. And according to Jude chapter 1 and verse 24, our merciful God promises to keep us from stumbling and to present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Think of that. <laughs> One of these days, he's going to present us to his father blameless and with joy because of what? His mercy. It's his mercy. We don't deserve this, but he does it because he is merciful and kind and loving. Man, that ought to cause us to rejoice. One of these days, he's going to present us to his father. Ah, yeah, John, you've messed up a lot of times. But I've forgiven you. You've confessed. I've forgiven. Here, here's John to the Father. Man, it's all because of his mercy. All because of his great love for us. And because he took the punishment that we deserved. And made it possible for us to be free. Friends, we who have been the recipients of such graciousness from the hand of God, we need to exercise this kind of mercy in our conversations, in our dispositions, in our attitudes and actions. In fact, Jesus sets the standard for us. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, Blessed, blessed are the what? merciful for they will be shown mercy I love the way Chuck Swindoll paraphrases that particular beatitude this is how he paraphrases it quote oh the bliss that's what the word blessed means oh the bliss of one who identifies with and assists others in need who gets inside their skin so completely he sees with their eyes and thinks with their thoughts and feels with their feelings. The one who does that will find that others do the same thing for him when he is in need. When was the last time we've crawled inside the skin of somebody else? When we are feeling what they're feeling, the hurt that they're feeling, we're feeling. And we come along them and we extend mercy and love and kindness. We don't push them down. We don't treat them as if they don't matter. The psalmist here is just simply saying, actually Jesus is saying, you know, when you are the recipient of mercy, you have a capacity to minister to others that is unique because of your transformed life can't expect non-believers to get inside the skin of others they just write people off they have nothing to do with people who disagree with them but as Christ followers we have been the recipients of mercy we've been the recipients of this bounty from God and because God is merciful he's equipped us to be merciful in our relationships with each other. Why is it that that is so hard in the Christian community to be merciful? 
Why is it that we always are trying to find something that nobody else knows? Why do we allow rumors to go around? Why do we let things be said that we know are not true and never challenge it? Why is that? What, what's, what's happened? I've seen believers that have been written off by others and they never serve again. They don't trust leadership again. It's because we have not learned as the people of God that because we have received God's nature, we are to emulate that nature. Of all people, we as God's people should be merciful. It's the greatest need for the 21st century church. Can you imagine what would happen in this community if the people of God all began to emulate our Father in heaven and are merciful in our relationships with each other? Number three. Wrap this up. A positive response to God's mercy. What is a good response? First of all, it must be a life of reverential trust. You see this in verse 11. Notice, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. When we understand that God's mercy is measureless, you cannot capsulate God's mercy. It's beyond measure. It's measureless. Notice, so great is his love, his mercy for those who fear him. God's mercy is measureless. His forgiveness is fathomless. Notice in verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far he's removed our transgressions from us. He's removed them. And he doesn't bring them up again. You see, see, I'm amazed at how many of us live in the past. We can conjure up every wrong, everything that's happened to us in the past. And too many of us live in the past and we haven't really understood the magnitude of the forgiveness of God. God's forgiveness is fathomless. And his love, notice, is endless. Verse 17. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him and his righteousness with their children's children. A life of reverential trust. That's what God wants from us as recipients of his mercy. And then a second response to God's mercy is a life of ready obedience notice again verse 18 with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts reverential trust a ready obedience these are the responses that we should be having when we understand how merciful God is. And as David contemplates the mercy of God, you come to the end of the chapter and he breaks forth into a doxology. And it's not a solo. It is a massive choir. Notice verse 20 praise the Lord you his angels he wants the angels now to join him in praising God
God for his mercy. You mighty ones who do his bidding, who obey his word, praise the Lord, all his heavenly hosts. He's asking the stars and, the, and everything he's created in heaven to praise the Lord with him. You his servants who do his will, we who have come into relationship to him. Verse 22, praise the Lord, all his works everywhere. <coughs> he is calling the vast host of heaven the mighty angels, the heavenly host, the stars, the planets, all that he's created to praise him. And then he makes a final statement, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. He's just overflowing in praise. Is that where you're at this morning? Are you just overflowing in praise? You just are so full of praise, you just can't keep it to yourself. That's how David concludes this. Now, we've been talking about <clears throat> the fact that we as God's people are to be merciful in our relationships to others. But you know, even those that don't have a relationship to Christ, they too recognize the mercy of God. I'm reminded of Joe Paterno. For 60 years, he coached the Penn State football team he ended up in a in a terrible tragedy because of moral problems that happened on his team but he made this statement when he was talking to one of the sportscasters he said this he said I'm not a deeply religious man but I go to bed at night and I say I don't know why God but you've been good to me now, if a person who probably doesn't have a strong relationship with Jesus Christ can just say, God, you have been good to me, he's experienced the mercy of God. God's mercy is extended not only to the believer, but also to the unbeliever. But he is calling us as his people to be agents of mercy and compassion and love. And when we are, we are fulfilling our calling. And God is using us to bring God into a world that desperately needs him. Let's stand together, shall we, for closing prayer. <coughs> Don't forget that as you leave today to place your helping hands offering in the little basket on the table. Lord Jesus, we're overwhelmed with your mercy. It is something that is freely given. It is something that finds its source in you and you alone. It's only through faith in what you have done for us at the cross that we can ever hope to be people of mercy. But Lord, when you change us, you take out the old and you put in the new. And Lord, I pray that in each one of our hearts today we will have a desire to feed the new and starve the old. And that in our relationships with others, people hear words of mercy, words of kindness, words of compassion, words that lift, words that build. May our mouths be channels of blessing in the lives of others because of all that you have done for us that we can never ever fully repay. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and that sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore we pray. Amen. Good morning and Maranatha. 
Lo, he comes. Have a great day in Jesus.